The Four Noble Truths are central to every Buddhist tradition. Zen or Tibetan and Vajrayana Buddhism. I remember at one point hearing a very elaborate and wonderful set of teachings from Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche, Tibetan Lama. And after it was over, he took questions and I raised my hand and said, is there anything in all these teachings that is outside of the Four Noble Truths? And he said, oh, absolutely not. If you understand the Four Noble Truths, all of the practices that I've been teaching are found there. And the Dalai Lama has expressed it in the same way. If you understand these four principles, then all the rest of the teachings come from that. The story is told of the Buddha under the tree of enlightenment, this beautiful and great Bodhi tree with spreading limbs that sheltered him for days. And finally on the evening of his awakening, where he came to a place within himself of perfect poise, even when Mara, the god of evil and struggle came and shot arrows and brought all of the weapons, the armies of Mara, the Buddha simply reached up and touched each of the arrows or spears with great compassion and in that moment it turned to flower petals and fell around him at his feet. So there he was on the night of his enlightenment as it's told and his heart became so still and his mind so clear that he could see far, vast, as if one were to look with a telescope and see the birth and death of beings everywhere, born, arising in a certain form and dying again and again. Beings like us who want to be happy but often are doing the very things that create unhappiness. And this cycle of doing the things that create unhappiness, the cyclic way of being entangled in the world, is called samsara. And so it's said by the Buddha, inconceivable is the beginning of this cycle of samsara. Not to be discovered is any first beginning of beings who, obstructed by ignorance and ensnared by grasping, are hurrying and hastening through the rounds of rebirths. He looked and he saw all the ways that we entangle ourselves in our lives again and again and again. And then in seeing that, also discovered the possibility of freedom, of openness, of a tremendous letting go of all of that entanglement and a release from those rounds of conflict and struggle and he sat then in perfect peace and joy for a long time. He saw what creates the life that we experience. So that Zen Master Sansanim, sitting under the same Bodhi tree some years ago, wrote a poem. He said, once a great man sat under this tree and saw the morning star and became enlightened. He absolutely believed his eyes, his ears, his nose, his tongue and body and mind. The sky is blue, the earth is brown. He saw life as it is and believed it directly. And so he became enlightened and freed from the cycles of birth and death. And then the Buddha, sitting in this great peace or joy, as the story goes, thought about teaching, how to teach this freedom, this peace, this joy. And he decided to teach it in the most direct and brave and straightforward fashion possible, which was called the lion's roar. So you might listen to these four noble truths for yourself and see if they're true or not. This is the straightforward teaching. You can look in yourself, in your experience, and see if they work for you. The first noble truth of the Buddha is called the truth of unsatisfactoriness or suffering or insecurity. The Buddha decided to start with this teaching so that he could lead people most directly to freedom. Rather than talking about joy and happiness and freedom, let's start where we're entangled 
and follow that thread till it leads us to freedom. The meaning of this first noble truth is that in this human existence, in this world, pain is unavoidable. It is a world of opposites, of gain and loss and praise and blame, of birth and death, of pleasure and pain, of fame and disrepute. Doesn't it happen to all of us? It is the way that it works. So the first noble truth, what now is this truth of suffering, said the Buddha, or of unsatisfactoriness? Birth is suffering, decay is suffering, death is suffering, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief and despair are suffering, not to get desires is suffering, to lose what one has gotten is suffering. In short, grasping any of the groups of existence is suffering. It is part of our human condition. If we look further at this human life, we see that pretty much throughout the century, certainly in the last half of this 20th century, there has been at almost any time, any moment that one could pick, 25 or 30 or 35 wars or revolutions in the world. And only if we see this truth clearly can we find freedom. There are millions today who are hungry, hundreds of millions. And yet 10% of the resources of the world that are spent on weapons could feed every hungry person. There are millions and millions of people sick today as there are those who are hungry, sick with diseases that we have cheap medicines for in many cases. In a third world slum, a mother cradles a whimpering infant in her arms. The child has diarrhea, the result of impure water, and is severely dehydrated. She will probably die within hours since the parents have no money for medical care. Three older children, pale and thin, huddle together in the corner of their small shack. Several kilometers away, at the seaport, a new shipment of military trucks and weapons is being unloaded onto the docks. That's the scene. This is the human realm. But it's not just the human realm. It's all of the realms we can see. Zen Master Isa, who used to write these tiny little haiku poems about animals, he writes, Don't kill that fly. Look, it's wringing its hands. It's wringing its feet. <laughs> Sympathy for the struggles of every being, human and others. Only when we see this can we find freedom. And it's not just global hunger or conflict or war or starvation, but it's also personal. Sickness when it comes in our lives, loss, depression, competition, fear, confusion, struggle, anger, jealousy, hurt. Anybody in this room notice those experiences in your life? And even when things are beautiful and they're there for a certain time, then what happens? They also will change. Suppose a man or a woman who was not blind beheld the many bubbles on the Ganges as they floated along, said the Buddha, and watched them and carefully examined them and then after they had carefully examined them, they would appear to them as empty, unreal, fleeting, unsubstantial. In exactly the same way does the meditator or the practitioner behold all of the phenomena of this life, of body, feelings, perceptions, consciousness itself, whether those of the past, present, or future, far and near. They change like that. We live in a society that doesn't like to look at this. And even when we have pleasure, you know, there's a little bit of suffering in the pleasure, isn't there? Because there's that thought that comes, how long is this going to last? How do I work it so I can keep it longer? How do I get more of it? And there's that grasping that comes in. It's like, again, the haiku from Zen master Basho. He wrote, 
Even in Kyoto, the most beautiful city in Japan, even in Kyoto, hearing the cuckoos cry, I long for Kyoto. <laughs> that is, even in the midst of having it, I watch it with my daughter. She has the ice cream that she wanted, and she says, oh, could I have some whipped cream for it too, please? Even in the midst of having it, or I want to eat it slowly because it's going to be gone so soon. You can understand that. And yet we live in a society which doesn't pay attention to that, which cuts us off from that. It's a culture, in some ways, someone called it a culture of pain management, right? <laughs> Where we have enough air conditioning and heating and things to take care of us and makeup or whatever it happens to be, I don't know, that, that things will be okay. The problem, says Adrian Rich, the poet, the problem unstated till now is how to live in a damaged body in a world where pain is meant to be gagged, uncured, ungrieved over. The problem is to connect without hysteria the pain of anyone's body with the pain of the world's body. Because it is part of our body as we are part of the world. It is ours. In Sylvia Borstein's new book, in some ways in the heart of this book, on, it's entitled, That's Funny, You Don't Look Buddhist, on being a faithful Jew and a passionate Buddhist, she kind of brings together these parts of her life. She speaks about the concentration camps and the Holocaust in the Second World War. And she describes her own experience visiting them and what she had to come to terms with. And after writing this, she went to pray to a temple. And it turned out that the day that she went was the day that's called um, Tisha B'Av. Um, and so there was a particular service that was done a kind of prayer. And then, as there is in the service, in every morning service, there was time for those who mourn, who are grieving the anniversary, the death anniversary of someone that day or that week, to stand and recite the yearly prayers. And most days there's just a few people that are standing, she says, people commemorating the death anniversaries of next of kin. But I noticed on this day that most of the group remained standing. And then I remembered that people whose relatives died in the Holocaust, people also who did not know the death dates of their kin, recognize this day as the death anniversary. So my father-in-law, whose parents were shot and then buried in a mass grave in a forest outside of Ushta Podolks in the Ukraine, said the prayer for them on this day, Tisha B'Av. And I looked at all the people who had remained standing and I thought, can all these people be direct survivors? And then I realized that we all are, and I stood up too. So this is the first truth of the Buddha to pay attention to. Is there anyone who doesn't know this or see this in your life? Then the second noble truth the cause of suffering in our lives, individual and worldwide. The cause is grasping. And this quality of grasping then becomes elaborated as greed and possessiveness, as hatred, aggression, uh, trying to protect or gain, and as ignorance, delusion, the sense of separateness that we actually can possess things or that the things we have or that the possession of anything will make us happy. And out of greed and hatred and ignorance come wars, come us and them, the separations, comes racism and tribalism. And the pain of that comes the hunger of those with no food and the riches of those who do. So globally, the source of most of human suffering comes from greed, hatred, and delusion, all forms of grasping. And individually, it is the same, our grasping at how it should be. We don't want it to change. We don't want to grow old. We don't want to lose as well as gain. 
and to the extent that we grasp, we suffer. So my teacher Ajahn Chah used to wander around the monastery at times, and especially if somebody was struggling, he would come up to them and say, are you suffering today? Perhaps they'd say no, and he said, oh fine, you know, enjoy the day. And if they'd say yes, then he'd say, oh, must be very attached. Kind of look at them, not any judgment. It's fine to be attached if you want to suffer. It's just how it is. And then he'd kind of walk away. It's that simple. It's also very practical. You can study it, this quality of grasping, in your life and in relationship to all the things that make up your life, your children your lovers, your money, parents, work, the ideals you have, in traffic, the way you think your body should be, the words you wish you could say or wish you didn't say. In any of these areas, notice how much grasping there is and then notice the consequences of the grasping. The Buddha saw this very clearly on the night of enlightenment, the cause of suffering being grasping and craving. He said, O house builder, thou art seen at last. Thy ridge pole is shattered, the rafters are broken. The ridge pole and rafters are craving and grasping. No longer shall you build this house of separateness of sorrow. Now to see this truth and understand this does not mean that we don't respond to the world or try to help. But deep down, the cause of suffering, if you get down to the gut level of what makes suffering, is grasping and trying to make it somehow the way we think that it should be. And then out of that grasping comes fear, manipulation, holding, aggression, rigidity, all those things arise, the more we cling, the more we suffer, or so this noble truth would teach. Now there are a number of different areas to begin to examine whether this is so in our life, the areas of grasping. To our senses and the world that they make up, of wanting this particular sight, or that sound, or this smell, or that taste, or this perception, or that feeling, my thoughts, my feelings, the way I want things to be, to the extent that we grasp at the senses and want them to register a particular experience, we can't be here for what is. We're not free. We're bound, struggling. Sometimes there is spoken of or taught a grasping for existence how we should be, how things should last. All that we claim, I or mine, I want this, I own this. And this creates or this comes from what's called the body of fear, this small sense of self, the grasping for existence, how my life is, all the thoughts about me and mine in my life. Do you know those thoughts? (laughs) And kind of how they make a circle around us? Then there's the opposite kind of grasping, the grasping of non-existence. That's the grasping that wants things to go away. The grasping that wants pain to go away, to disappear. I don't want to deal with this. And so we contract and barricade ourselves and in fear or judgment or aversion or aggression, push things away. And you can feel it if there's pain in your body Often there'll be the sensation, which is very intense, fire, throbbing, tingling, and then we give it the name pain, and then there's the contraction, the whole body contracts around it. And then there's the fear that comes, how long is this going to last? And then there's the story, I hate this, maybe I have a terminal disease, and we go and (laughs) write our epitaph and have to go and say goodbye to everybody, and so forth. And we do this whole thing instead of just feeling that this is one part of our body experience. The contraction, the fear, the stories we tell, all of which create suffering. Instead of learning just to be with our measure of pleasure and pain as it comes to rest in the heart of a Buddha, 
and know that the world has joy and sorrow and pleasure and pain and light and dark. Overcome any bitterness that may have come because you were not up to the magnitude of the pain that was entrusted to you. This is from the Sufis. Like the mother of the world who holds the pain of the world in her heart, each of us is entrusted with a certain measure of cosmic pain. And you are called upon to meet that pain in joy instead of self-pity. So the grasping to senses, the grasping of me and mine and how it's supposed to be myself, all those thoughts and feelings, the grasping of non-existence and the avoiding of things. How about the impossible grasping of trying to redo what's already done? How many of us have done that? You know, somebody said forgiveness is letting go of all hope for a better past. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean, in speaking of grasping, a lack of commitment. Commitment to work, commitment in relationship, commitment to our vision of what's beautiful to bring into the world, commitment to our spiritual practice. To live wisely requires a wise caring, a healthy attachment to one's children, a willingness to stay present and love again and again in the face of change and pain but it's to act without grasping at the result. Because the extent we try to grasp our children, the extent we and they suffer, notice it. The extent we try to control and grasp our partners, we can't even do with our own bodies or minds. You take care of it, you love it, you respect it, care for it, but we don't possess it. Instead, this is speaking of unclenching, of letting go, of ease, of embracing of freedom, even chaos is okay. This is from Zhuang Tzu. He says, As regards the quietude of the sage, she is not quiet because quietness is said to be good. She is quiet because the multitude of things cannot disturb her heart. When water is still, one's face and eyebrows are reflected in it. A skilled carpenter uses it in a level to obtain a measurement. If still water is so clear, how much more are the faculties of the unfettered and silent heart? The heart of a sage is her mirror of heaven and earth in which all things are reflected. So to ungrasp is to let go and be with things as they are. First noble truth, the truth of change, unsatisfactoriness, suffering. Second truth, the cause globally and personally, the amount of grasping, the sense of possession that's false. The third noble truth, as the Buddha saw the suffering of the world, he also saw beings with but little dust in their eyes who were on the verge of being able to understand. And tears began to stream down his cheeks as he sat under the tree of enlightenment, the tears of compassion. So he began to teach. It is possible, my friends, for the heart to be free, peaceful, loving in any circumstance. This is your birthright, your Buddha nature. And it's what we learn as we sit in meditation here in our practice. From Pema Chodron, wonderful teacher. The father of a two-year-old talks about turning on the television and unexpectedly seeing the bombing of the federal building in Oklahoma City. He watched as the firemen carried the limp and bloody bodies of toddlers from the ruins of the daycare center on the building's first floor. He says that in the past he was able to distance himself from other people's suffering, but since he's become a father, things have changed. He feels as if each of those children were his child. He feels the grief of all the parents 
as his own grief. This kinship with the suffering of others, this inability to continue to regard it from afar, is the discovery of our soft spot, the discovery of our Buddha nature, our noble awakened heart. It is said to be present in all beings, just as butter is inherent in milk and oil is inherent in a sesame seed. This soft spot is inherent in you and me. In difficult times, it is only this Buddha nature that heals. When inspiration has become hidden, when we feel ready to give up, this is the time when healing can be found in the tenderness of pain itself. This is the time to touch the genuine heart of the Buddha within. The third noble truth is the end of suffering, the truth of liberation, of freedom, of nirvana in the midst of all things. Nirvana means coolness, ease. Strictly speaking, if you read in the Buddhist texts, nirvana means the end of greed, hatred, and delusion. And for a disciple thus freed, in whose heart dwells peace, there is nothing to be added to what has been done, not more remains for them to do. And for one who has considered all the contrasts on this earth, and is no more disturbed by anything whatever in the world, the peaceful one, freed from rage, from sorrow and longing, has passed beyond birth and decay. This is the Buddha's description of nirvana. I'll read you another description. This is from these writings I'm working on in the new book of people's spiritual experiences. This is kind of the moment of Satori of a Zen master. It's a whole pages leading up to it. The body pains opened up, the struggle stopped, my mind became luminous, just radiant, vast like the sky filled with the most delicious scent of freedom, awakening. It felt like grace had descended upon me. I felt like the Buddha sitting effortlessly, hour after hour, all the time feeling as if I was completely loved and protected by the whole universe. I lived in a world of unending peace and unspeakable joy. And the truths of life were so clear. How grasping is the cause of suffering, that by following the small sense of self, this false ego, we run around like the petty landlord squabbling over nothing. I wept at all our unnecessary sorrows. And then I saw the whole idea of spiritual renunciation as a kind of a joke, trying to make oneself let go of ordinary life and pleasures. In fact, nirvana is so open and joyful, is so much more than any of the small pleasures we grasp after. You don't renounce the world, you gain the world. So this is nirvana. And nirvana isn't some place that you get to at the end of some long journey. It is any moment, moment to moment nirvana, it's called. The peace in a moment when we are present and open, when there's a grace and a graciousness that neither grasps nor resists, but is simply here with life as it is. To see in the eyes of a person, a child, the leaves fluttering in the wind, the sunlight in the morning, just to be present itself is the place of nirvana, of peace. And it's an immediate experience. It's also a bodily understanding. I think you know it. There's pain and then there's our struggle with it and all those layers I talked about, contracting and fear in the stories. And then in some moment, we can just let go and say, oh, that's just pain. Or that's just intense sensation, isn't it? And we let go of the contraction and fear and all the stories. And then we learn the difference between pain and suffering. Pain comes and goes. Suffering is optional. <laughs> Take your choice. So in a way, it's the end of struggle, as my teacher Ajahn Chah said. We human beings are constantly in combat, at war, 
to escape the fact of being so limited, limited by so many circumstances we cannot control. But instead of escaping, we continue to create suffering, waging war with evil, waging war with good, waging war with what is too small, waging war with what is too big, waging war with what is too short or too long or right or wrong, courageously carrying on the battle. Why not step out of the battle, he would say. Come over here under the Bodhi tree. It's so cool and pleasant. (laughs) Kind of an invitation. And you know it. Sometimes we've done this teaching in here of the Buddha in the midst of difficulties, finding that in your life. You see yourself in some struggle or fight or physical pain or something in work or creative process you're involved with and there's difficulty. And then if one remembers in a moment, you know what it would feel like to let go in the body. There is in us this knowing. From Zen Master Dogen, he writes, Just understand that birth and death itself is nirvana, and you will neither hate one nor cherish the other. Only then can you be free. This present birth and death is the life of Buddha. If you reject it with distaste, you are losing the life of Buddha. If you grasp it, attaching to birth and death, you also lose the life of Buddha. Do not try to gauge it with your mind or speak it with words. When you simply release and forget your ideas of body and mind and throw yourself into the house of Buddha, you become Buddha. This is extremely easy. Refrain from harming, cling to nothing, and act with deep compassion for all beings around you. This is to be the Buddha. Don't search beyond it. It is here within you this moment. So these are the kind of instructions and reminders. Dogen gave them in Japan a thousand years after Buddha's teaching in India, but they're the same instructions. Freedom that doesn't mind chaos. In fact, Chogyam Trumpa said chaos should be regarded as good news. Extremely good news. It's only those moments that remind you that you are not in charge. (laughs) Freedom to say yes to life, to say yes to change, to say yes to the 10,000 joys and the 10,000 sorrows. And from this freedom of the heart comes true love of life, of others, of the, the world, of oneself. Because true love doesn't demand that things be different. It doesn't grasp or need or control or try to claim. It's just their loving, connected in that appreciation. And this is the third noble truth of the Buddha. It is here for us in any moment. Walt Whitman writes, I find letters from the divine dropped in the street and everyone is signed by God's name. And I leave them where they are for I know that others will punctually come forever and ever. And I or you, pocketless of a dime, may purchase the pick of the earth, and to glance with an eye or show a bean in its pod confounds the learning of all times, and there is no trade or employment but that the young man or woman following it may become a hero, and no object so soft but it makes a hub for the wheeled universe and any man or woman shall stand cool and supercilious before a million universes. And I or you, pocketless of a dime, may purchase the pick of the earth, and letters from the divine are dropped in the street, every one signed by God's name. So funny, we get all these ideas of who we're supposed to be and how we're going to make our life and all of that. And this amazing show is going on all around us. The fourth truth is the path to freedom, which is also called the middle path. The middle path is that presence which neither grasps nor resists life. The great way is not difficult for those 
who cling to no preferences. When attachment and hatred are both absent, everything becomes clear and undisguised. Make the slightest distinction for better and for worse, and everything is lost. Heaven and hell are set infinitely apart. There is in this human existence, with its suffering and its joy, the possibility of freedom in this moment and any moment. The goal of practice is to keep our beginner's mind, says Suzuki Roshi, not to become something, but to be here and here and here again in each moment. It's not to try and understand things, but to be present for this mystery of life. Woody Allen said, I'm astounded by people who want to understand the universe when it's hard enough to find your way around Chinatown. <laughs> it's not far away, nearer than near, because what we seek is really ourselves, our true nature, our Buddha nature, our empty nature, our full nature, all these different languages for it, what's sacred or divine to be at peace with ourselves. What a wonderful thing to be at peace with yourself. Forgiveness. Many promising reconciliations have broken down because while both parties came prepared to forgive, neither party came prepared to be forgiven. So there is not only the offering of forgiveness for all the things that didn't come out the way we hoped and wanted and expected them to be, but also the willingness to be forgiven for our part as well. Because while both parties came prepared to forgive, neither party came prepared to be forgiven. There's a sense of graciousness and ease, of peace of the heart when we can forgive life as it is and when we can be forgiven. And then when the heart is still and the mind peaceful, it becomes clear like a mirror, the heart or mind, and responds to the world quite naturally. You don't have to think about it. If a child falls, you help them up. If someone's hungry, you find food. If they're sick, you offer medicine. If there's injustice, you work for justice. You don't have to think about it. It's there as simply as breathing or taking a step or drinking a glass of water. And from that place, we are unafraid in the face of pain or sorrow because we know it's part of life and yet can respond to the injustice <laughs> and work for beings and give what we can. But from a place of ease and caring and simplicity that doesn't add fuel to us and them and the struggles of life. This is the middle path. Wise understanding, wise speech, wise action, all of those things come out of the peaceful heart. In this way, the middle path is every path. And the middle path is each one of us. Everything becomes our path. It is a moment to not grasp and another moment to not grasp and rest in wholeness and beauty or joy, nirvana, all those great names. The peace of your own being, to be at peace with yourself. And when we're at peace with ourselves, we're at peace with the world. So I end with one more Zen poem. Trailing my stick I go down to the garden's edge to call a friend to go out the pine gate with me. The winter rains have washed away the planks of the bridge. Shouldering our sandals, we wade the narrow stream. I dabble in the flow, delighted by the shallowness of the stream, gaze at the stone flagging, admiring how firm the rocks are. The point of life is to know what's enough. Why envy those other world mortals? 
With the happiness held in one inch square heart, you can fill the whole space between heaven and earth.